keep them running. I keep them running. I keep them running. Running. Now stop to the yard of breath. Putting in about a thousand reps. Addicted to the grind like a pound of meth. Tonight I rock a lot of how I climb the best. Welcome to the Football Autobiography Show. It is such a pleasure to be with you all today, wherever in the world you are listening. The Football Autobiography Show is dedicated to taking you on a football journey with football's most interesting players, coaches, trainers, staff, and journalists. Think of these as mini football autobiographies. Each guest will show you how they got where they are now, reveal their techniques for success, and what they've learned along the way. Today we go inside the world of football data analytics, one of the newest driving forces behind why football is changing so quickly. If you want a progressive and intellectual look at the game, then this is the episode for you. Our guest is Head of Football Intelligence at 21st Club, Omar Chowdhury. Chowdhury is responsible for consulting clubs in the Premier League to help them gain a competitive advantage and build sustainable success. He helps them with everything from choosing the right manager to identifying undervalued transfer targets. Previously, he worked at Prozone, where he carried out statistical analysis. He regularly writes on 21st Club's blog and was the founder of a previous blog called Five Added Minutes. In this episode, he discusses growing up in Singapore, how he would calculate wins above replacement in football, the biggest mistakes clubs make when hiring managers, and how he transitioned from amateur blogger to professional analyst. Without further ado, sit back and enjoy the episode. I'm here with Omar Chowdhury at 21st Club, head of football intelligence. It's such a pleasure to be with you. Thanks, thanks for having me. Uh, before we get into all of the work you're doing here with 21st Club, uh, I want to get a little bit of information about your background and your history. Uh, where did you grow up and what was your childhood like? <laughs> um, so I, I was born in London, um, but actually grew up in Singapore. Um, went to a British international school in Singapore. Um, and yeah, I very much enjoyed school. I suppose I was um, yeah, one of those people who, um, who kind of enjoyed all the different subjects I did at school, maths, economics, English. All those types of things always had an interest in, in football growing up um and yeah i uh i suppose had a good childhood and and then moved back to the uk uh, for university and have, have been here ever since oh wow. so you grew up uh, all the way till you were like 17 uh, 18 in, yeah 18. in singapore yeah oh wow that's yeah. incredible um, yeah yeah it was, it, was, it was a really good place to grow up uh okay so uh how how did growing up in Singapore like sh- it shape you for your future? <laughs> Tough question. Uh, I don't know. I mean, Singapore, the, the school I went to was very, very good in that it was one of those environments that uh, it was it was cool to be clever. It was one of those environments where you got on really well with the teachers. Um, so I, yeah, I suppose I've always enjoyed um it was, it was it was a school that encouraged you to think and, and, and prepared me pretty well for university and so i guess um if you think about what i'm doing now i suppose it, it's probably led to that to some degree because it's one of those things you know I've, I've taken a very unacademic pursuit which is football which was my interest outside of school and combined it was i guess some of the the things that i enjoyed in school which was the academic side was it tough transitioning from Singapore to, to moving to England? Uh, no, not too bad. I mean, as I say, I was at a British school in Singapore, so you are in almost like a little bubble there um, where, yeah, you're living a very expat British lifestyle. Um, and then I moved to the UK and suddenly I didn't have to watch Champions League matches at 4 a.m. I could watch them at 8 p.m. and that was, that was a relief. Um, that was the only transition, I guess, and yeah. probably an easier transition to make than going the other way. Yeah, no, as, uh, as I mentioned to you before we started talking uh, on this podcast, uh, I, I used to live in Korea mm. and the, the time difference is it's just <laughs> yeah. like, it's impossible yeah. to watch. The fans games. out there are so dedicated though. I mean, like the, the yeah. amount of people who wake up in the middle of the night to watch football, it's it's seriously there's seriously passionate fans and i think sometimes in the uk you forget that yeah. um and forget that all these clubs you know clubs across the premier league have support out in asia um and so we talk about this is 
perhaps going to some of the things we do now, but you know, talk about some of the TV rights deals here. There's there's a lot of talk about it being a bubble peaking in the UK, but the scope for growth in in East Asia in particular is massive. Um, you know, the, even in China, for example, they're, they're not paying anywhere near what they do in in Hong Kong or Singapore yet. Um, so yeah, it's it was. You know, I guess there's some place in the world you can grow up where they're not too big on football, but Singapore was, was definitely not one of those places. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I remember for the, the Champions League final, um, uh, not this year, obviously, but last year when uh, Atletico and Real played, I mean, I stayed up all night uh, till like four in the morning to, and then went to work the next day. It was, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was just ridiculous. And, that, and I wasn't the only one, like. I was in a bar full of people that did the exact same thing. It yeah, was, was I mean, I remember, I remember watching Champions League finals and having exams the next day, uh, and that was always a fight with the parents. <laughs> I really wanted to watch the game, but uh, yeah, sometimes that's a, the, the game would start at 3 a.m., so I'd record it, wake up at 5 a.m., hope it's not gone to extra time, and then just watch it on repeat. But uh, yeah, they were, they were good times. Yeah, oh, wow. Um, <laughs> so what was... You, uh, did you play football growing up? No, no, I've, I've always been a pretty rubbish footballer, so <laughs> I've, I've always kind of stayed on the sidelines, to be like. Did you play any other sports? Or? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I played uh, at school casually, cricket, tennis, football, um, rugby as well at school. But uh, yeah, I've always been keen at sports, if not particularly good at sports. Okay. So you, you moved to, the, uh, to England to go to university, and you study economics. Mm-hmm. Uh, did you want to be a an economist or go into business or what? Yeah, I mean it's a good question. I mean at the time, um, I guess I did economics because um, I it was a subject I probably enjoyed the most at school. It seemed the one that was that gave me the most breadth of options going into a career, which I didn't really know what I wanted to do yet. I think um, I I felt like actually at the time when I went to university, I might want to w- work in media. Um, but that, that's obviously changed since then. I think, yeah, economics was a, was a choice because it interested me. And at the time, I didn't really think about it being useful in sport, potentially. I was thinking oh, it would probably give me, as I say, good breadth for other career options. But as it turns out, it's been pretty vital for, for what I'm doing now. Uh, in, now that you have hindsight, sure. um, would you have gone, if you went back to university to do it all over again, would you still study economics or I think a so, yeah. Career? Um, economics or potentially computer science. Um, I mean, economics has been, I've actually, if anything, developed even more of an interest in economics since leaving university. Um, I, I tend to read up a lot more on it now and that type of thing. Um, so I think my interest for the subject is still there. So yeah, probably on balance, I, I probably would still, would still do economics. So at university um, is where you started your blog, uh, Five Added Minutes. Mm-hmm. Uh, what was your inspiration uh, for, for the blog? So that was, a, I started it in January 2011. Um, and at the time, I probably joined Twitter about a year before, nine months before or so. Um, and I think Twitter had helped me um, gain the realization that there was a lot of analysis that was underground, if you like, that was nowhere, that was so much better than the analysis you saw on Match of the Day and on Sky and on whatever, ESPN or Satanta, whatever it was at the time. Um, and I felt that um, I wanted to be part of that community that was trying to provide better analysis and trying to challenge some of the some of the kind of received wisdoms and myths that um, that were in the game. So yeah, I set up, I set up the blog um, to be part of that but also at the time I was doing a lot of student radio uh, which I really enjoyed um, and I had a, as I mentioned earlier a real interest in getting into sports media um, and so the blog was was a way I guess of me saying look at me I, I can come up with other ideas that might be useful in, in sports media um, but actually what, what I found was that um, in writing blogs that try and debunk myths about football a good starting point is to look at the data first um, and at the time I was in my second year of, of doing economics um, and I'd begun to pick up these skills that could help me analyze data um, and so yeah I, I kind of put the two put the two together football and, and data and started digging into some of those myths um, so I was looking I mean the first blog I wrote was looking at um, the winter break in, in English football looking at some of the evidence that existed picking out some more data around attendances and players and teams at the tournament that type of thing um, 
and then I'd look at other things around, I don't know, the classic cliches like 2-0 being a dangerous lead or looking at what, when is a good time or bad time or, or uncertain time to second manager. So all those different types of topics. And um, yeah, at, at one stage I was probably writing a blog with three or four blogs a week. Um, uh, yeah, at one stage. Um, but uh, as, as the exams took over, I suppose that died. Yeah, down. I mean, yeah. You, that's three or four a week. not really sustainable. <laughs> no, it really wasn't. No. But I really enjoyed it. Um, it was one of those times. It was one of those times as well back in 2011 where there was only a handful of analytics bloggers. There were other, other people out there. I should probably probably name them guys like Chris Anderson who's obviously gone on to write the numbers game um, uh, Mark Taylor uh, was a really good analyst who I know well now who um, was writing at the time um, Sander and I'm not going to have a go to surname but Sander writing 11 taking 11 which is a very good blog um, Sarah Rudd um, who's now a stat DNA so there were a few really good bloggers around at the time and I was trying to take some inspiration from them um, and and now obviously the community is much much bigger and, and the the quality of content is much much better than than what I was producing at the time. What was your, uh, I mean it it sounds uh, like you really just fell in love with it mm. um, kind of once you started doing it uh, more and more. Uh, but what was your objective like once you started writing like was was it like oh I want to get a job from this or is it you just yeah, so it was a combination, I think, if we're being like brutally honest. Uh, initially, as I said, I think I wanted it to be a bit of a CV that I could send to media companies, and actually that's, that's what I did in the first instance. Um, and I ended up, um, I did like a couple of weeks at a radio station and, and have been involved in, in newspapers and that type of thing. Um, but yeah, I, 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 was, I was mainly doing it because I was trying to answer questions that I thought were interesting. Um, and so I was just trying to discover new knowledge about the game that perhaps didn't exist before, uh, outside maybe betters. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, it was a combination of, of writing about things I was interested in, trying to answer questions, trying to be that guy in the conversation who could actually say, actually. You know? <laughs> um, but also, yeah, beginning, particularly my final year of university, sending it out to companies and to people who I was beginning to discover worked in the industry. So I remember there was an article in, I think, July 2011 by Simon Cooper, who'd written Soconomics, um, and he wrote an article in the FT about the data revolution in, in football, um, and he went and interviewed a few clubs, and he spoke about how Wenger first used, uh, first used data, and, and I remember reading it thinking, you know, Jesus, the, this is the type of stuff I've been writing about, or at least I've been using data in, in football, surely some of the things I've been writing about have some relevance, so from that article I kind of began to seek out people working in the industry a bit more um, and kind of went from there. Yeah I mean like it uh, that you, you're talking about like kind of the the birth of it and uh, you you were just like right in the right time. It, yeah, you know, oh, yeah yeah I was, I was absolutely right place right time. It, it, around, another piece of context as well is that um, the Moneyball film came out in I think 2011 or 2012 so you had this massive groundswell where uh, for, you know the book, oh, the book had obviously been out for 10 years, um, but it hadn't really kind of made waves in, in this country anyway. Um, but the film obviously with Brad Pitt and Jonah Hill was going to, and, and it did. And I remember as I was graduating university, there were a lot of football clubs talking about this film and how it was going to change the industry and that type of thing. Um, so yeah, it was, it was beginning to gain momentum then. Um, and... Yeah, as I say, the, the, the community, at least on Twitter, that there were probably people outside of Twitter at the time who, who I didn't know about, um, was, was relatively small. But since then, in the last five years, it's grown, grown pretty quickly. Yeah. yeah. So your, your blog's doing well, and um, you, you know, you're writing three or four times a day. When did people start to notice it? Uh, and like start like messaging you or like you know people in the industry um, and what was that like I mean yeah you know? I mean the, like Twitter is like one big ego trip isn't it I mean yeah, everyone everyone loves having the retweets and likes I I, I think it was pretty steady with my blog I, don't, I you know I, I would spend in the early days I would spend a lot of days like directly tweeting it to people and just trying to get feedback and it was pretty positive on the whole um, because I wasn't I wasn't really doing things that were um, uh, I guess abstract in any kind of way I wasn't try, trying to create models that try to quantify certain aspects of the game I was just purely trying to answer questions um, and so I didn't get any of the pushback, pushback of uh, oh you can't use statistics in football it's too fluid I was mainly just trying to answer a, a lot of the time often more kind of top level questions as well less kind of in play questions I'd look at some things around kind of 
passing that type of thing, but nothing in, in too rigorous detail. Uh, so generally, it was pretty positive. Um, and so, yeah, through 2011 and 2012, um, yeah, seemed to get pretty good feedback on it, and that just encouraged me to, to keep going. And so you, uh, after your blog, uh, you go to Prozone, which is one of the like, first da data analytics mm -hmm. companies uh, in, in the UK, at least. Um, what was that job like, and uh, what did you learn from it? Yeah, well, I, sh I should say just before Prozone, so about six months before, I worked very briefly at a company called Decision Technology, um, and uh, the main guy working there was was a guy called Ian Graham, who's now um, I think head of research or certainly on the analytics side at Liverpool. Uh, and there, I spent a couple of weeks um, helping write or helping do the research for the Think Tank column, which is an analytics co football analytics column that goes in the Times um, every Saturday. Uh, and so I learned a lot there. And those, it's amazing how much you can learn in two weeks there. Because yeah. um, no, because I, I like you know I pulled up mm. your your bio and it, I saw it was like one month. Yeah, uh, yeah. You were there, and I was like. I don't know, like, yeah, we just, yeah, like what we happened there, yeah. if we need to get to that. No, no, it was, it, was cru it was really crucial. I mean, I learned a lot there. I mean, it was the first time I was actually working with big data sets. Um, so previously, I was having to get data online, whatever I can get a hold of. Um, but this was the first time I was working with you know, data sets that had come directly from Opta at the time. So, you know, lines and lines and lines and lines of data. Uh, and that was, I remember the first day getting home and just like kind of going, Phew. that was, that was tough. Like, I, I, I was being asked to, to, I can't remember what the first um, thing I looked at was, but I was, I was being asked to really kind of um, uh, manipulate data on a level that I'd not really done before, and certainly not done at university, and I was having to do for the first time. Uh, but picked up very quickly that the guys who worked there were very, very good. Um, they were uh, really kind of helpful and um, gave me a lot of encouragement, and I think I got a lot out of those two weeks. Um, and that in turn helped me with the, with the pro zone uh, pros and got, uh, so, uh, so it was like a boot camp. Like it, it was, was a little like, bit of a boot camp. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah and, and around the same time, I was sending my CV out to, to Prozone. Uh, also, mainly my blog rather than my CV. Um, and a guy called Blake Worcester um, was someone who read it, um, and I spoke to him and, and the MD of Prozone, a guy called Barry McNeil, um, and they Prozone didn't have a what you call like a data scientist at the time. Um, they had analysts in house, which would help clubs with their support them with their data and their video and that type of thing. But but they, Prozone was sitting on a, on a wealth of data that hadn't really been analysed in a huge amount of detail. Um, as I say, Moneyball had just come out, and so there was a lot of uh, a feeling that they they wanted to do this. Uh, Opto had already hired an analyst at the time called Sam Green, um, who actually works here now as well um, as and probably get onto this with, with Blake um, setting up 21st Club. But yeah, so Blake and, uh, and Barry offered, offered me the job uh, at, at Prozone, uh, which I was <laughs> delighted to take. Um, and that, that was a really cool experience. I mean, I, I was there for two years, um, you know, really great company, great culture. Um, and again, massive learning curve in the first few weeks. Uh, it was great because obviously in the first few months, given relatively free reign, because it was a new role that the company had carved out and just wanted to see where it went really. Um, so that was that was quite fun because I could look at kind of anything I wanted, I guess, um, and try and create a demand for that type of work. Um, which and, and that department grew. So after a year, we hired uh, Paul Power, who, who's still there. Prozone now known as Stats, um, who we brought over. As uh, so Paul, really good guy, um, really smart guy who did kind of more tactical analysis. Had a guy called Michael Clarkson, who was. Um, really good with sports science and really interested in sports science data. He now works at a company called Catapult. Uh, Hector um, was another guy I worked with who was very, very bright. He came in from Liverpool, John Moores, and was doing research around playing styles. So we built up a really cool team there that could deliver different types of things. I was mainly on the recruitment side, sort of trying to understand metrics that could be used to evaluate players um, in more informative ways. Um, yeah, so it was it was a really good experience. What was you said it was it was a the first couple of weeks there was a steep learning curve, oh. um, and, and same with your previous job. Mm. Uh, what was the biggest adjustment you had to make from blogging mm. about it to actually working in the in the field? Yeah, good question actually. Um, certainly, obviously, the amount of data you're dealing with is larger, which. Um, it's more of a kind of technical question. Uh, I'd also say um, with my blog, I, um, it, it, 
and this is one of the things that I now really kind of focus on now in my job is, is the communication of, of the analysis you're doing. So my blog, it would be, um, I just almost write it for myself in some degrees and hope people kind of read it and were interested in it. Um, the moment I worked at ProZone, you're obviously working with, directly with clubs, um, you're dealing with a whole range of, of people who have a whole range of interests and competency and kind of uh, receptiveness to data. Uh, and so you have to be able to adjust uh, in that respect. So, yeah, whether it was um, really trying to get the language right around the metrics you're creating or really trying to put it into a proper football context rather than just saying X stat is, is Y or whatever. Um, you know, understanding what a metric actually means in a, in a football term. What does it look like in video on the Can pitch? you give, a, give an example of, of what you mean uh, a specific? Yeah, example? so, I mean... Uh, a few different ones. So I mean, like with with a lot of the kind of basic metrics that you get around passing and um, yeah, passing is a good example. So all the pass completion rates um, are obviously influenced by the types of passes that players are making. Um, but then you look at things like the amount of forward passes someone's making, and I think initially people felt that was something around like how direct they were or how kind of keen they were to get the ball forward. But a lot of the time when you looked at it, it was more related to where they were playing on the pitch. So we would do a piece of analysis and, and a club would tell us that they want a player who can play direct, get the ball forward, get the ball moving. Um, and you'd go, okay, well, the first step you look at, that, at there is, is forward passes, rate of forward passes. But actually when you looked at, uh, at that stat, for example, you were, you were really finding that the only thing that was picking up is if, if a player was playing deeper, he was playing more forward passes. Whereas actually they wanted someone in that in zone 14, that area in the edge of the box who was making those types of passes. Um, and so you would have to then move away from those kind of calculated stats that exist in the, in the kind of public domain and move into more uh, bespoke stats you could create. Or at least if you didn't have those stats, try and uh, find players who relate to people who you do have those stats for, if that makes sense. Um, so yeah, just trying to provide additional context around that. Because for however many years uh, at the time, 10 years or whatever, people had just been using the same kind of stats and, and assumed they meant one thing or assumed that X led to Y, but it wasn't, wasn't always the case. Yeah, it's not that, it's not that simple. Exactly, yeah. Always. Yeah. Um, I'm happy you brought that up. It's something I was going to get to later in, in the podcast, but I'll bring it up now. Um, when you're talking to a manager or a club and mm. they're – you know, and you're you're trying to relay all this information and stats, and you have to pick the right language, as you said. Yeah. Do you have a specific approach to relay that? Is there like a, a system you have? Yeah. Or um, examples uh, work best. Um, so, yeah, we, we'll do a bit of market research or a bit of um, yeah analysis that will show general trends in in the area that you're looking at so whether it's in the transfer market whether it's with managers whether it's looking at international football and you will say you know uh, i don't know x percent of the time this happens um a lot of the time that doesn't mean a lot of, uh, to, to people they, they need to understand what was actually mean so you go okay well this is an example of player of this player doing that this is an example of this team doing that um and or you look back in hindsight, what, what these results would have suggested the right decision would have been. Um, so it is really about pulling out stories a lot of the time and, and pulling out examples, because that's what people remember. remember. Yeah. Uh, and that's what tends to work best. Yeah, no, I mean, I know it's, it's true with me. I'm sure it's true with, uh, with you as well. I mean, when, when someone gives you like a proper analogy, then mm. it, you can imagine yeah, exactly. it like, you know, in your, in your head. Exactly. Uh, so you're at ProZone and uh, what, it was the impetus uh, to, to move on or to, to come here to 21st Club? Um, so after, I mean, a year at ProZone, um, uh, Blake, who, um, uh, who who brought me into ProZone when I set up 21st Club, um, and I stayed in touch with Blake, um, I knew him well, um, and yeah, I, I you know, had a couple of conversations with him and... and saw what they were trying to do here and I, I was re it really interested me because 21st Club was more about um, I guess strategic analysis for football clubs uh, and that was um, something I guess that interested me and it was more around my 
skills, if you like, um, having done economics, was more around the kind of boardroom analysis. So I'm not a coach. I'm not. Um, I'm not someone who's worked in football clubs before. Uh, I'm not someone who gets gets all the tactics and, and, and can you know make a game plan and that type of thing. I'm someone who who understands, um, I guess, better what clubs are trying to achieve strategically and try and solve those problems um, through data or just through logical thinking. Because a lot of the time, football football lacks some of that logical thinking. Um, so I really like the what, what the 21st Club were trying to achieve. They're only a year old at the time. Um, only had a couple of guys in London, uh, Blake being one of them, another guy called Aaron, um, who was um, on the operation side. Uh, and I thought, um, you know, I, I want to try and... I was, I don't know, how old was I? I was 23. I wanted to try and grow something. There's not a lot of opportunities you get to do that. As you get older, you get more and more responsibilities, I guess. So I didn't didn't have that burden at the time I could I could up sticks and move um and yeah it, it really excited me um being part of something small and trying to trying to change an industry at a, at a, at a boardroom level really um so that was that was a key motivation obviously I knew Blake and got to know Aaron really well um and from from that group of three plus a couple of developers um we've we've kind of grown into a, to a much bigger business since then yeah, and get a little bit more ownership since you're getting in at the beginning. Yeah, I mean, speak, we've spoken about learning curves. I mean, first uh, few months, I mean, still still the case now, really. Just um, being at a small business, you get to do everything. So I've been obviously on the analysis side, which is which is my main main area, but product development, sales, marketing, you know, getting out and meeting people, pr- presenting, all those different types of things that, um, you know, a lot of people don't get the opportunity to tr- to try all those things out and I was very lucky that Blake was kind of had the faith in me to do that. Is there one of those that you just mentioned or something that you didn't expect in your role that like oh I really enjoy marketing or pitching a yeah, yeah. product like what is Well I, I always I always suspected I enjoyed um, kind of pitching stuff um, but the product development side has been really fun being a part of here um, so we've got software uh, that we sell, sell to clubs and um, really enjoy trying to shape that software uh, and trying to make it as smart and as relevant to, to clubs as possible um, and yeah I'm, I'm no software developer by, by any means but I like trying to take the ideas try and visualize them try and communicate them to our developers and then seeing the results of that so I guess doing, doing the easy bit of, 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 <laughs> of the production line if you like um, hey, someone, has to do someone has to do it I guess yeah yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, that's been uh, I've, I've really enjoyed that, um, and it links to the analysis side as well. Because whenever you do a piece of analysis, you're trying to think how that how that works into some of the software. Yeah. So uh, you mentioned that you you're not uh, a football player by nature, yeah. at least, and uh, a lot of your background comes from just like your economics or tactical. In in this industry, and, but, I mean, you can talk mm-hmm. a little bit more personally. Uh, how much do you have to know about the actual sport? Because, I mean, you don't just do football mm. right here at 21st Club. I know uh, you do other sports as well. Mm. Like, I mean, I think I saw that you guys do golf and yeah. uh, cricket. Uh, uh, mainly mainly but, golf, but, but, yeah, we yeah. never know what, what's uh, next, really. But um, what? how much do you have to know about a sport to do this job? Uh, yeah, I mean, it, obviously, the more you know, the, the better, I guess. Um, I... I, I absolutely love football. I watch you know, a lot of football, and so I, um, yeah, I, you know, when when you have those conversations with boardrooms and, and you're chatting with people within clubs, uh, you've you got to have a handle on what's happening in the game. You can't you can't be ignorant to it. So um, yeah, I mean, it just comes naturally to anyone in this business. You, you know, if you if you work at Twenty First Club or Fifteenth Club, our, our golf business. Everyone who works there knows a lot about about the sport because it's just a passion, really. Um, it's not it's not a chore by any means. So, um, yeah, it's it. You know, I enjoy chatting to about football to, to various football clubs because you know they, they all have bring different perspectives and, and you can bring different perspectives to them. No, no, because I'm just curious because uh, famously in the United States recently, or maybe not super famously, mm. but. Um, uh, baseball executive just who is like heavy on da- uh, data analytics just uh switched over to an american football club mm. uh to like be a, a, a chief executive there. okay uh and so i mean i was just curious yeah like, i mean like, you probably will get those switches in due course i think football i think is a little bit of a challenge in a couple of respects firstly um 
culturally, um, there's always, uh, I guess, a bit of a... Historically, there's been a bit of a closed-minded mentality in, in football. That is that is changing, absolutely, like no, without question. Um, and so that makes it difficult sometimes for outsiders to come in. Um, there, there was a great article in Wired magazine about four or five years ago which spoke about Clive Woodwards, who was the, the Rugby World Cup winning coach, going into Southampton and just asking really simple questions that... No one really knew the answer to. Yeah, but I, they, read, they, I read that. Yeah, so exactly. I for this. Yeah, yeah and they, they push back on on that, yeah. um, which is really really interesting. Um, and so that that's I guess a similar example to the one you're talking about. Um, so yeah, I mean I, I think yeah a lot of people who work in football have an interest in football. Um, unlike the US, I mean I don't know how how it works really as as a kind of broad industry thing, but football doesn't always offer the biggest salaries for people working in the front office or back office. Um, whereas in, in American sports, I don't, I don't know what it's like, but uh, no, no, they definitely earn 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 much uh, much more money. I think. Yeah, yeah. so you can you can you know talk about a computer science graduate coming out of university now, yeah. he could see the prospect of six figure salary at some point down the line working in uh, in the city. Whereas in, in football, you'd have no idea where you'd end up. You could end up you know really high up, or you could end up just being a kind of end up at the wrong club and and having your work not valued. So um, there is an element of that as well. Uh, so what, it, besides having an analytical mind, of course, but what skill do you find yourself uh, using the most or do you, have you found is the most beneficial? Um, in- um, yeah, I mean, so the analytical mind one's interesting because I think the, anyone who works in, in football analytics, anyone I've spoken to has read um, Thinking Fast and Slow, which is the Daniel Kahneman book, um, which is probably... Uh, probably the single most important read for anyone who wants to work in the industry because it teaches you how to think critically about things and it teaches you how to think critically about all the inherent biases we have. And football is full of biases, it's full of things that we think we know but we don't actually know. Um, and yeah, I think that reading that book was, was really important to me because I actually understood, okay, I could see all these things that are being written about in the book that applied in football and the Kahneman and Tversky, his, his research partner, were coming up with solutions for that, or at least how to identify that you were thinking in this way. Um, and so that, that, that to me is the number one thing. And then obviously you supplement that with either the, the actual analytical computing skills or whether it's pre- presentational skills or whether it's knowing football skills, if that's, if that's a thing. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's starting with that ability to think critically uh, about a problem and then and then trying to solve it yeah so uh your job is head of football intelligence yeah. and, and when i first read that i was like that it's you're like the m of um, <laughs> like you know like you're you, you have a couple da- james bonds you know beneath you but um can you just uh quickly describe what y- your role is and then what the average either work day or work week Mm. is like so um my role i guess has been relatively fluid as as i kind of mentioned earlier um throughout my time at 21st club primarily it entails overseeing the analytical output um, of the business so all the models that we develop all the kind of insights that we create uh, i kind of lead on that um and then in i'm also involved in the communication of all that to the clubs so i'm kind of i guess halfway between the the consulting and communication and software side and the actual kind of engine room in the, in the, um, in the background. Um, and so over time, we've, we've built up a bit of a team where we've had myself um, and uh, obviously the guys in the team, guy called Luis Susio, we have here, who's, a, who's an absolutely brilliant guy, um, Harvard statistician. We've had other analysts before who have um, developed these engines that we, these models that we then take to market. So, so my typical day is, is generally, um, I guess, a lot of the pulling together the analysis that we've created as a team and then pitching that or sending that to clubs based on you know, project work and so on. Um, so in, in, for example, this week, uh, we've been doing a, a bit of market research for a club uh, I've been doing some of that research. Luis has been doing some of that research. I've had research of it done before as well and pulling that all together, uh, presenting it, and then, and then later in the week, sending it and presenting it to the club. Um, so that's quite a good example of, of, of a typical week for us. So, so how often do you, like, you and a couple other guys here that are analysts or whatever, just, like, sit around 
this board table that we're at um, and just like kick around ideas or say, hey, like I read this the other day. That seems like it's uh, totally like, you know, bullshit. Like, yeah, yeah. You know, how often does that like, you know, kicking around ideas All, all the time. I mean, so we, we've got a big open plan office um, where we're all sitting kind of, everyone's close to each other really. Um, and yeah, all the time we're talking about um, different ways of thinking about the game or uh, we would, you know, a game would be on TV or a game would have been on last night. We'll be discussing things that were related to that and saying, oh, I wonder if you could quantify that or I wonder if that has an effect or I wonder if um, we're overvaluing that or whatever. Uh, so that those conversations happen all the time. If you've stuck a mic in the office and left it playing for a day, you'd hear all kinds of all kinds of things. You'd hear a lot of like random shit, yeah. um, but you'd also hear, hear quite a lot of hopefully interesting interesting perspectives on, on things. What was the last thing that when you were having like one of those like you know, types of conversations mm -hmm. that you were just like, you, that kind of blew your mind like that, oh my God, I had never thought of that. I think we've been discussing a lot recently around the relative value of, of different positions in general. Um, so there was an article again in Wired um, before the Champions League final, which, which we kind of um, uh, contributed to. Uh, and we've been discussing it at, at great length around um, the value of your kind of top striker relative to a typical replacement level striker and the same at, at a goalkeeper level. And I think historically in football, um, there's this belief that uh, goalkeepers and defenders tend to be undervalued because they command lower transfer fees and they're clearly, I mean, they're clearly important players to the team, but um, they, don't, they, don't tend to, um, they don't tend to command the wages and, and, and transfer fees for that. And, and Luis has been really good on this. I mean, he's developed some models that um, that support this as well. Uh, but generally, it does seem the market seems to be relatively efficient. It's not, a, it's not an efficient market, the, the transfer market, but relatively efficient, broadly speaking, around the, the relative worth of, of attacking players to defensive players. Um, and I'd, I'd, I'd always, I'd historically been at the camp that, that goalkeepers and defenders are undervalued. Now I'm actually slightly less sure. Uh, I, there are obviously defenders and goalkeepers who are undervalued and some who are overvalued. Um, but, you know, th there are some great examples of, you know, how often has, for example, a team lost its goalkeeper and just collapsed, fall, fallen off a cliff, which doesn't really happen. Whereas, talk about strikers, that happens quite a bit. I mean, the most obvious example is Liverpool losing Luis Suarez yeah. uh, and just the following season, they're an absolute car crash. Um, and that happens a lot more for attacking players. Yeah, Mario Balotelli players. is, is just no Luis Suarez. No, he wasn't, yeah, he was, he was a classic, I guess, replacement <laughs> level player. Um, and it's the same for defenders as well. It's, it's rare that a team loses a, a defender and just falls completely out like of Southampton this season. Van Dijk and Ed Font for the start of the season lost both of them in the second half of the season. They were fine. They, they didn't really concede fewer goals. That's because defensive work tends to be more around organisation. You know, you tend to, some teams defend with 11 men. Most teams defend with at least seven or eight men. Um, so it is more about the collective, whereas in attack, it is more about those moments of individual brilliance um, that open up a game and therefore... When you, when you have that value, you know, a team, an average team scores uh, as many goals as they concede. So in attack, you're talking about kind of four or five players contributing in, in a key way to that attack, whereas in defence, it's much more spread out. And so that's, that's been a really interesting discussion we've had for a number of weeks and months now. Um, and in that, obviously, we, we kind of take that to clubs and try and understand Okay, where are some of the gaps within your squad and where can you get the best value for money in terms of improving your team? Um, and, and so again, taking that strategic view on the squad first before making the decisions on, on who you buy. Uh, you alluded to something uh, that I, I wanted to hit on, which was in the States in baseball, which is probably the first place of, first birthplace of like real analytics. Mm. Um, and in it, they have a stat, wins above replacement which is ex exactly what you just uh, yeah, alluded to yeah. before. And um, I want to know, first, how close are we to a stat like that mm -hmm. in, in football? But second, I mean, you're one of the foremost thinkers in this area. How would you go about making that stat? Take me through your thought process, even though I believe, yeah, that yeah. Not, I know it's complicated, so you don't, you know, yeah, uh, yeah. I'm not expecting you to come up with the theory <laughs> now, but like, what, what's your thought process for tackling such a massive problem? What, are, what things are you considering? And uh, the first thing I'm considering is asking Luis next door and saying, <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? Um, he, yeah, I mean, we, we, 
I think we're, we're getting towards that. I think it's still a long way off. Um, you know, we've, we've got a few ideas on, on how to tackle that. I think broadly, again, this is a thought experiment Luis has come up with, which I think is really, really clever. If you take, um, if you take Chelsea, for example, so 90 points per season uh, in the last season, and you take Hull, um, who were... Uh, uh, who were 35 points-ish in the last season. So that's a 55-point difference between Chelsea and Hull. Um, now imagine, at a very crude level, you took a Chelsea player out uh, and you put in a Hull player. So you got 55 points between them and you slowly replace one, one by one, that's 11 players. So that's 55 points spread out across 11 players in a team. So broadly speaking, uh, you know, if you imagine Chelsea's replacement level players are Hull's level, they're probably a bit better than that actually, but let's say they are, they're Hull's level. You're talking about five points per season um, per player, which on a points per game basis is, is obviously relatively low. So I think the first thing to say is that you know the average or your when you lose a player is probably not going to affect you as much as you think. Um, certainly a key player, yes, it'll be more or less depending on the player, but so on. So that's your kind of starting point, and that gives you, I guess, uh, a base level of how much a player is is worth relative to a replacement level player. Um, and then so there's, there's different ways you can go about, go about it from there. So you can, you can either kind of, I guess, get into the nuts and bolts and try and look at comparing individual players in key metrics that you know, are related to success. So whether it's the ability uh, to get into good scoring positions or the ability to get the ball into good scoring positions or the ability to get the ball into good positions from which it's easy to get the ball into good scoring positions and so on. Um, so that type of thing you can evaluate players relative to each other and then scale that on that kind of Chelsea to Hull scale that I'm talking about there um, so that's one way of going about it uh, you can also take a, a more I guess agnostic view uh, and try and look more broadly at results and try and identify well historically when a team loses its best defender how much does that cost cost the team when a team loses its best attack how much does that cost the team and then go okay well we apply that to the, this level of what the team is we can get a good sense of because um, we have a pretty good sense of how good teams are so it is the issue of players within teams that we struggle yeah. with isn't it um, and so using those kind of principles and applying it to a team level I think I think it's possible but it's not an exact science and even when we do come up with we think this player is worth one point per season above your replacement level player that will for us that's our starting point and then we go well actually he's playing at a club that plays a completely different playing style He's 29 years old, so he's getting on a bit. Uh, he limited resale value, whatever. So maybe actually, when you factor in some of those things, maybe he's not actually worth the money that you're prepared to pay. Yeah, or uh, yeah, just you know, he's only good for that system. Exactly. Um, yeah. So you mentioned, uh, or you, you kind of got around it, but what what are the biggest challenges in uh, in this field or in your job? Um, yeah, uh, it's, it's a number of different things, I guess. Um, one, one of the key ones is um, what I mentioned earlier around the culture in football. So you're trying to, you're really trying to change the way that people think. Um, some people, in a lot of people actually in the industry already think like in that kind of Kahneman tones I spoke about earlier. Um, but a lot of people have never come across that and don't understand um, some of the biases that might exist in their thinking or some of the flaws that might exist in, in the processes that they have. Um, so you're really trying to provide evidence that suggests that you should go a different way. Um, and even then when you do, it's, it's difficult to, to move both. I mean, the, these clubs are very old institutions in many ways, so they can be a bit of an oil tanker sometimes. Um, so it's not so much on the analysis side, because I think we've got, we've got a lot of data, we've got a lot of smart people. We, we're, we're capable of, of analysing that data. And there are people across the industry outside of this business that can do that. Um, but it is really about trying to change cultures and change ways of thinking within football clubs that's probably one of the biggest challenges can you take me through a specific uh incident where a football club i mean you alluded to woodward having this problem mm. and the wired piece but yeah can you talk about a more personal experience where a club just wasn't receptive to what you were trying to tell it and maybe how you dealt with that situation yes i mean the the classic example um is, is around experience. So we've faced this in a, in a couple of areas where clubs will value t certain types of experience. So whether that's in recruiting players or hiring managers. Uh, in the Premier League, it's often we want someone who's got Premier League experience. So we want someone who's played in the Premier League, knows the league, because there's this perception, 
which is true to an extent, but it's not, it's not as big as what people think, that the Premier League is this kind of unique league that needs adapting to. You know, in a, every league's kind of unique, yeah. um, but at the end of the day, it's football and people can adapt. And actually, when you look at the data, players bought from the Premier League or managers hired from the Premier League don't tend to do any better or worse than players bought from outside of the league. Um, and so you present that evidence and uh, you will also present examples, as I said earlier, you know, as one of the, one of the tools you use is, okay, well, look at all these players who cost much less and were bought from outside and did as well as all these kind of English Premier League players or managers. Um, but, you know, even when, even, when you present, even when the clubs are presented with the evidence, you do get pushback. Um, they just feel safer with their own biases. And if you show that there's no effect between it, um, they will still resort to to what their biases are. So I think we've had some success in some areas in, in kind of opening up new new avenues, but it is kind of like chiseling at, at a kind of a rock face. Um, and, you know, eventually, hopefully, we'll get a nice sculpture, but uh, I, it will take a bit of time. If w- w- someone from the audience wanted, was interested in uh, the industry, what blog or what, uh, column publication mm. could they would they would you suggest they start out and also kind of a follow up to that is who do you read uh, yeah. most often and who inspires you uh, so I I mean we get that email a lot we get CVs in you know every other week really of people asking um, you know uh, if not if not for jobs per se but for advice on the industry and first thing I send them is is a list um, of kind of people on Twitter that a guy called Colin Train has pulled together uh, which I think is a, a really good list of people to follow and just go from there and then and then from there yeah it's it's like it's it's reading all the stuff that everyone on that list puts out really um, a lot of it's interesting a lot of it's probably slightly less relevant to some of the things we do now at 21st Club because um, a lot of the analysis is kind of tactical or or at a kind of um, event level um, whereas a lot of things that we do perhaps aren't necessarily related to that but but at the same time it's all part of one big space so there, there are things that that link um so yeah i mean i read i read all of that i mean i, I yeah i suppose that's the the, the stuff that people are putting is it, there's not a lot in the kind of mainstream space that i think exists um that um i think I, i'm just trying to think off the top of my head that i read on a regular basis um a lot of it is by amateur bloggers or people in, in the industry really um so, yeah, the, the, I, I'll get on Twitter and <laughs> read everything that's on there, really. Well, I'll definitely make sure to check out that list because, I, I mean, I, I never uh, heard of it before yeah, you yeah. mentioned it. Um, I'm, I'm just going to read a quote um, to kind of preface my next question. Um, you mentioned amateurs. Mm-hmm. Uh, you said everyone can collect data and everyone has similar data. Uh, so it's what you do with it that makes the difference. Uh, this was written in a, in a piece um, online. Uh, what separates pros like you versus amateurs <laughs> and what mistakes do amateur you know, bloggers or analysts or even just beginners uh, make the most? Um, <laughs> I don't want to, <laughs> I, I don't want to do, yeah, I don't, I don't want to do like a, a big kind of pro amateur split because there's a lot of people who, who, um, who I respect and, um, who work as amateurs and do it as a hobby. Um, and I, so I, in many respects, I still consider myself a bit of an amateur working in the pro space. Um, I, I think, um, yeah, the one, like I mentioned earlier, the one big thing I've learned is, is around the communication um, of, of the insight. Um, I, particularly in the audience that we work with, short, sharp, punchy, straight to the point, um, very clear, very clear examples. I mean, that's the thing that, um, I uh, that our audience kind of is most receptive to, and I think a lot, a lot of people within clubs are most receptive to, because people at clubs are very busy, right? They, in most jobs that you have, you don't have this week to week event that takes place. You have the ability, you might have like a quarterly boardroom meeting or, or whatever, but in football, it's every single week. So people in clubs are naturally busy. Um, and so whenever you deliver something, it has to be kind of quickly digested. And I think that's the one big thing that um, I think is key if you want to be communicating to a club. I think, um, yeah, sometimes, uh, yeah, go go a bit 
too long or some of those things and it, and it just kind of goes over people's heads sometimes yeah so we're in the summer right now clubs um a lot of clubs have already hired their manager for next year but not not all clubs mm -hmm. uh clubs seem to go through managers like <laughs> uh you know it's just like a, a new pair of shoes uh one they i think the stat is it's something like the average Premier League manager is only there for like 15 months yeah. or something. Yeah, yeah. That. Um, what can clubs do to hire uh, managers that are maybe that's maybe more sustainable mm -hmm. um, in the future? And is there any like data metric that uh, they they should look at? Yeah, so I mean it's it's a really good question. I think um, one of the things that always uh, amazes me is that whenever a new manager is hired. There's always so much hope, so much expectation, so much feeling that this, this is the manager who's going to take us to the next place. And you know that on average in 15 months or 18 months, he's going to be gone. Um, but you, you completely forget about that when, when the manager is hired. Um, and, and all the fans and all the boardrooms kind of forget about that. So the question is when you're, yeah, can you, can you beat the odds and can you get this guy over 18 months? What, is that hope justified? Is that kind of feeling justified? Um, and... We believe there is. I mean, we've, we've done quite a lot of work um, in helping clubs trying to hire managers now. Um, and I think it's a really interesting space because historically, the only metric or one of the few metrics that clubs have used is win percentage, which is really not useful because uh, for starters, obviously, you know, a manager's results will depend in significant part on the, the quality of the players that he has. Uh, secondly, he might have gone up and down divisions, so that might have skewed the win rate. You don't know how it translates across leagues. Um, so there's obviously a lot of issues with that stat. Um, but you can, you can look at other things. So we, we will look at things like how much a manager has improved the club, uh, how much has he performed relative to resources that he has, um, how much, what type of playing style does he have. Uh, and we'll go into all these things after we've actually done a questionnaire with, with the club. Uh, and we try and identify what are some of the things that they find that they kind of value and prioritize. Yeah, like their vision. Exactly. Yeah. So I mean, a lot of a lot of clubs I think hire who's available. You know, they'll they'll look they'll they'll sack the manager and then go, okay, who's available? Who's just been sacked by another club? Which is an extraordinary way of of hiring in any industry. Like, <laughs> imagine in, in any other industry, you 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 lose one of your people in your team and you go, okay, well, let's look for people who recently lost their job. Uh, it's, just, it's just not not a particularly logical way of going about it. Um, so we, we all say, okay, well, we'll go to the club. What, what type of things do you value? Do you value attacking football? Uh, and when you say attacking football, what does attacking football mean? Does it mean goals? Does it mean playing attractive football? Does it mean high pressing? Um, do you want young players coming through to the first team or are you happy spending each year? And if you're happy spending each year, do you want a manager who has a track record of getting in players who, and, and they utilise those players, have very little wastage of, of, of cost? Um, do you want a manager who's used to limited squad turnover or do you anticipate, anticipate if you're in a lower division, perhaps more squad turnover? So we're going, we, we have a list of questions that we send to clubs and they, they come back and they say, well, this thing's clearly more important to us, this thing we don't really care about. Uh, and from that, we'll shape our analysis around some of the things that I mentioned earlier. So if they really want someone who's, who's performed at multiple clubs and, and improved, those, improved multiple teams, then that's one of the things that we'll, we'll wait. If resources are an issue at their club, that's one of the things we'll wait. If they don't really care about playing style, we'll say, well, you know, the managers you're looking at have got kind of very, very playing style, but it's not so important to you because you feel, for whatever reason, it's not important. Um, so typically, it's a dual process we work with clubs because often they'll have some kind of shortlist um, that identifies managers that they're interested in. And based on what they've told us, we'll say, well, these managers tick the boxes. Um, but, and then we'll say, okay, well, actually, there are five, ten other managers who tick the boxes even better than the five you've got there. Um, and actually, have you, have you considered those? And so I think that, um, yeah, clubs have been really receptive to that. Um, they like, I mean, it's, it's literally increasing the information that they have by 10, 20, 30 fold, um, coming from win percentage to actually having reams of information on, I'm on sure the they're blown away sometimes. They, I think the, the, the biggest um, uh, compliment we get, I guess, because football clubs aren't re don't readily hand out compliments, but the biggest compliment we get is that when we do a piece of work on managers, more often than not, um, the clubs will come back and say, oh, can you actually add this guy to the list? Can you do a bit of due diligence on this other guy? So that to us is validation of the fact that they valued it on, on the five or six people we've already looked at. They want to understand how this other... I saw the manager ranks up. So that's happened a number of times now. And 
um, yeah, the, I think clubs, clubs clearly value it. So I'm going to read a Simon Cooper quote. Mm. Um, the manager used to be considered the messiah. Now he's becoming just a caretaker who oversees a large staff that will keep working after he is sacked. Everyone from physios to defensive coaches to data analysts. Day to day, these staffers may have more impact on results than he does. Media love talking about managers, but really we should be talking about management teams instead. Do you agree with that quote? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think um, the, one of the extraordinary things amongst the other extraordinary things that I mentioned earlier was that the way that clubs hand over the keys to managers for someone who's only going to be there 18 months. Um, so a, a great example is a club like Southampton, who, um, although they recently sacked um, Claude Puel, have got a very good track record of hiring managers who plug and play. They come into the system, you know, Everything else is taken care of. The recruitment, the youth development, everything else around the club is taken care of. And the manager just comes in, coaches the player, takes care of Saturday. Uh, and that's what Southampton done very, very well. And as a result, they're probably one of the most sustainable mid-table teams in the Premier League. Um, and that's, a, you know, they were, they were in League One what, six, seven years ago. Um, so they're a great example of, of kind of um, uh, living out that, that Cooper quote. Um, and, and that's absolutely one of the things that, that we preach is, is managers coming in and, and, and doing a job for the club. But at the end of the day, sometimes things don't work out and they're, they're going to move on. Um, you know, our analysis suggests that a manager is typically worth between, you know, it's, if you take a kind of better than average manager relative to a slightly worse than average manager, that can be worth around seven to 10 points a season for a club. Um, and so it's not, you know, it's not Messiah levels, as, as you say, you know, seven to 10 points, okay, it can be quite a lot and can be the difference between relegation and staying up. But it's not, you know, sometimes I think when managers come in, it's like, this guy's going to take us like, you know, to the Champions League final. It's, it's not really like that. Um, you know, every, every person contributes a little bit, um, but it, they're not, they're, there's no one, one kind of uh, silver bullet that solves everything. And a manager certainly isn't that as well. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I, I would agree with that. Um, at least that's what it, the trend's looking mm -hmm. at. Um, a popular question is, is usually like, uh, you know, if, if you could change something in the past, what's one decision you would change? Mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm going to flip that a little bit. Okay. Instead, I'd like to know, what's one decision that at the time of making it, you were unsure of mm -hmm. that in retrospect, you're really happy that you made? It's funny, because if Blake listens to this, he'll, um, he'll laugh. But I remember... Um, well, I was first chatting to Blake. He was asking, you know, what, um, uh, how interested would I be in joining? And I was kind of like 60. I said, I think I said 65, 35 percent to him in, in favor of joining 21st Club. Um, and um, so I guess there was some there was 35 percent uncertainty there, if you like. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I've uh, I think it's been a really good decision for for me. What? Would uh, what would you have as the first line of your career obituary? Or, or I'll give you. Or, <laughs> wow. That's a difficult. Well, you're also very young, so yeah. what, uh, what, well, I'll I'll flip that. Actually, maybe change it a bit. If okay. you can take that, or the other option is, where would you like to be in twenty years? Oof. I have. I mean, that's not that, physically. Yeah, yeah, you yeah, can yeah, take yeah, that yeah. Too, But you know. Yeah. Um, it's it's a really difficult question. I think um, so. It's one of the one of the one thing I've I've kind of learned in this job is that prediction is very hard. So I'm going to make a prediction of where I'm going to be. I, I know you said where would I like to be. Um, I, I don't know. I, I think I'd like to be influencing decisions at in a major sporting organisation. I don't know whether that's in football. I don't know whether that's uh, at what level or whatever. But um, I want to be yeah. Um, Wait, at the organisation or at like an independent. Well, either or. Consultant. I mean, okay. I mean, we're we're doing that now, I guess. Yeah. Um, but obviously, it's it's on a kind of um, a project by project basis, if you like. Um, so, yeah, I I, uh, I tend not to think too far ahead because the you, you never really know in uh, in uh, in football and in, in any industry really where where you'll go. Is there anything you'd like to promote? Uh, how can fans uh, reach you? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm on Twitter at Omar Chowdhury, um, which you can get the spelling right. I'm sure you'll you'll post up the spelling. Yeah, um, yeah I mean, I uh, uh, happy to happy to help anyone who wants to kind of get into the industry. Happy to chat um, and and offer any kind of kind of advice that I have. Um, I'm, I'm sure. Um, 
yeah, however I can help really. Uh, it's it, People take different routes into the industry. Uh, I can only speak of my own experiences, but uh, yeah, more than happy to speak to people. Well, it's been a pleasure hearing about your, your journey no, uh, thank in you. the industry. Uh, so. Thank you. Thanks for having me. If you like the show, please subscribe on Stitcher, Podcast Addict, iTunes, whatever podcast app you have. Also, if you enjoyed the show, please check out my page on Facebook, The Football Camino. Leave a comment, give a suggestion. Everyone is welcome. Please connect with me there or on my Twitter handle, which is at Football Camino. So get in touch and I'd love to hear from you. And you can also subscribe to my newsletter, which gives you behind the scenes look at how I did the interview and other information that never made it out into the published episode. So please check that out on my website at thefootballcamino.com.